Welcome to Doomtown. Doomtown is an expandable card game set in the Deadlands universe. Based on the classic collectible game, it is a fast-paced game of gunslinging, spell-slinging, and mudslinging. We're going to use poker hands and card pools for everything from gunfights to summoning abominations. Today, we're going to learn some of the basics for greenhorns and some exciting early advice that even a marshal could stand to hear again. We're going to talk about what cards we have, how they move, how they cast spells, and how they sling lead. We're also going to go through a full day in Doomtown. The goal of Doomtown is to gain more control points than your opponent has influence, and hold on to those control points until the end of a round. Control points are shown as blue chips on cards, and influence is shown as red chips on cards. For your first few games, you're going to be choosing one of the four factions that come out of our base game. The Noble Law Dogs, who are trying to keep the town together. The Dastardly Sloan Gang, who are trying to rip it apart. The Money-Grubbing Morgan Cattle Company. And the Fourth Ring Circus, who are as mysterious as they are dangerous. In Doomtown, you'll find four basic card types, keyed in by the poker suit they have. Spades give us dudes. These represent the heroes and villains of the world as they go about a few days in town. These cards have influence, which prove your status in town, and bullet rating, which shows how tough they are in a fight. Diamonds represent land and businesses in the form of deeds. These cards generate currency in the form of ghost rock, and are our win condition in the form of control points. Clubs are the actions we take throughout the game. These one-shot effects help you react to your opponent, plan jobs to defeat them, or catch them when they're cheating. Hearts are the suit of cards that represent our accessories, be it a pistol, a new hat, or even some evil arcane spell. These cards stick with your dudes and help them out in various ways. Let's start off our day in Doomtown, and I'll explain some things as I go. Each player starts by selecting an outfit card that represents their faction. A stash of Ghost Rock and a group of starting dudes will begin the game in play. You may only start the game with dudes from your faction, or factionless dudes called Drifters. Your outfit card is called your home, and is the first location you'll have in play. Select up to five dudes from your deck to begin the game with, and pay all costs. To pay a cost, simply lose Ghost Rock equal to the dude's cost, located in the bottom left of the card. Once you and your opponent have paid for all of your dudes, it's time to draw your opening hand of five cards and start the first day. Days in Doomtown start at the gambling phase, and during the gambling phase, we play lowball. Each player places one Ghost Rock from their stash into the center of the table to be used as an ante. If you are unable to do so, you can owe the bank a Ghost Rock, which you'll pay back during production. To play lowball, each player reveals the top five cards from their deck, which forms a lowball hand. Use those cards to create the best possible poker hand. Then, the player whose hand is the lowest rank wins the antipot and becomes the winner for the day. Hand ranks are listed from the lowest rank of high card all the way up to the rare dead man's hand. You can see the full hand rank list on your player boards included with the base set. After the winner claims the antipot, we enter the upkeep phase. During the upkeep phase, each player gains Ghost Rock. The amount of Ghost Rock you gain equals the production on all of your cards minus the upkeep on all of your cards. Now we're about to enter the noon section of the game. Noon is the main phase of the game where most of the actions in a game take place. The primary actions of the game are shopping, acting, moving, and calling out. Starting with the winner, each player takes one action at a time. When one player chooses to not take an action, it's called passing. When all players pass in a row, the noon phase ends. Let's say the Law Dogs player is the winner and go through a sample turn, illustrating the different actions you can take. The Law Dog player decides to take a shopping action. This allows you to select a goods card from your hand, pay the Ghost Rock cost, and place it onto your dude. This must take place at your home or a deed you control. You control any deed that you put into play or that you have the most influence at, but we'll get into that a little bit later. The Sloan Gang player then takes a shopping action as well. You can also use the shopping action to buy deeds. Deeds are locations that your dudes will be able to move to. When you play a new deed, you place it along your street, to the leftmost or rightmost of your home. Deeds that are next to each other are considered adjacent. Dudes can also come into play this way, but they always interplay at your home. Spells are also attached as a shopping action, but we'll get to those a little bit later. 
Actin is what you do when you choose to use a card that says Noon in big, bold letters. Any card can have a Noon action, deeds, actions, and dudes. Even your home can have one. The Law Dogs player will opt to use the ability on their home, which reads Noon Boot. This is an action you can take during Noon, and it means that you boot the home card. To boot a card, turn it 90 degrees to show that it has been used. Not all actions require you to boot the card, but each action can only be used once per noon phase. The only exception are cards that say repeat. Law Dogs, Noon, Boot. Choose a card. Boot your dudes with a total greater influence than the chosen dude's influence to raise that dude's bounty by one. This card does a few things. First, choose any dude in play, let's say, Ali Hensman from the Sloan Gang. Then the Law Dogs player needs to boot dudes who have a higher combined influence, that's the red chips, than Ally has. Luckily, Lucy Clover can do that all by herself. Now that we've done that, we increase Ally's bounty by one. This makes her wanted. Wanted is a trigger for other cards, such as Bounty Hunter. Whenever a wanted dude is defeated during a shootout, the person who defeated them earned Ghost Rock equal to their bounty. It's the Sloan Gang's turn again, so they are going to make a move-in action. Move-in is simple. Boot your unbooted dude and move them to any new location. There are a few extra tricks, however. Dudes at home or in town square don't have to boot if they move to an adjacent location. Your player board will help with that in your first few games. The Sloan Gang moves Alley, wanted or not, into the town square. The town square is a neutral location in the center of town. All in-town deeds and each player's homes are adjacent to the center of town. The Law Dogs player replies by moving Philip to the center of town as well. Uh-oh, it looks like trouble's brewing. The Sloan Gang player takes a callin' out action. Callin' out is the fastest way to make two dudes fight. Select one of your dudes to call out one of your opponent's dudes at the same location. Then, we enter a shootout. The Sloan Gang selects a leader, Ali Hensman, to call out a Mark, Philip Swinford. The Mark has the option to move back home booted or to stay and fight. Philip's here and he chooses to stay. Both sides then form posses to help fight. The leader forms a posse first, then the Mark. Any dudes in the same location, or unbooted dudes at adjacent locations, can join the fight. Since this shootout is in the town square, Ali has Lawrence boot to join the fight, and Philip chooses to fight alone. Now that posses are formed, each player takes turns taking shootout actions. Just like noon actions, these are special actions that use the word shootout at the start of them. Starting with the winner, each player takes an action one at a time until both players pass in a row. Shootout actions can weaken an opponent, bring a new dude into the fight, or even send an opponent's dude home. For this fight, no player has shootout actions, so we'll move on to the next step. Select your shooter. Each posse selects one primary shooter, typically based on their bullet rating. The Law Dogs select Philip, as he is the only person in his posse. Because of the pearl-handled revolver, Philip has a one-stud bullet rating. During a shootout, you will attempt to make a poker hand with the highest possible hand rank. You will have five or more cards that you select the best five from. You always draw five cards, and then any additional cards based on your posse. If you have a stud as your lead shooter, you draw extra cards equal to their bullet rating. You then draw one additional card for each other stud in your posse. In this example, the Law Dogs player will draw six cards. Ali has a two-draw bullet rating. Since the lead shooter is a draw, the Sloan Gang player draws five cards and has the option to discard two cards. If they do, they draw two new cards. You can also discard an additional card for each draw shooter in your posse. The Sloan Gang player will draw five cards, but can choose to discard three cards. Each player then selects the best five-card poker hand they have. Philip reveals a three of a kind. Since his hand could be from a real poker deck, it is considered legal. Ali reveals a three of a kind as well. However, since there are multiple two of hearts, this hand is considered cheating. As we enter the resolution step, we will take resolution actions before comparing the two hands. Since the Law Dogs player is the winner, they go first. They choose to play Coach Whip, which is a cheating resolution card, which means it is a card that can only be played in the resolution phase and has to be played against a cheating hand. Cheating cards severely punish players who choose to be greedy when they build their decks. 
Coach Whip allows the Law Dogs player to ace any dude in the shootout, so they choose to ace Lawrence. If a dude is aced, they are sent to Boot Hill and will not return to play. After resolutions have completed, we compare hand ranks. The player with the highest hand rank wins! The loser must suffer casualties equal to the difference in hand ranks. If someone wins by four ranks, the loser would suffer four casualties. One casualty is suffered by discarding a dude in the shootout. Two casualties are suffered by acing a dude in that shootout. Since these two hands are tied, there is no winner. However, each side still suffers one casualty because it's a tie. Both players must discard their dude in all attached cards. Don't worry, since they were discarded, they will have an opportunity to come back to you when you draw them again. If there were more dudes left to fight, the shootout would allow the loser's dude to run home booted, and then the winner's dudes. If any dudes stick around on both sides, we go for another round. After the shootout, we return to the noon phase. However, I think both players want to rest. Each player chooses to pass, and we head to sundown. The first thing we do is check for victory conditions. The way you win the game is by having more control points than your opponent has influence. The control points being all of the blue chips on your cards, and the influence being all of the red chips on your opponent's cards. The Sloan Gang has one control point, and the Law Dogs have three influence. This means the game will continue. Each player then has the option to discard a card from their hand. Then, each player refills their play hand by drawing up to their maximum hand size, which is usually five. If you run out of cards in your deck, simply shuffle up your discard pile and keep going. We unboot all of the cards in play, and then we enter a brand new gambling phase. Well, that's just one day in Doomtown. Players take turns until one player is able to control the town and win the game. Before we let you ride off into the sunset, I want to tell you about three more things. Skills, jobs, and some advanced topics. Many cards in the game represent magical spells or incredible gadgets. In order to bring those into play, you need a dude with skills. Hucksters can cast hex spells, and mad scientists can invent gadgets. To play a spell card, simply pay the cost and attach it to your huckster. You can then cast the spell whenever it says you can, be it a noon, shootout, or react action. Each spell has a spell difficulty, which is the number next to the word hex in the text box. To cast a spell, you make a skill pull, to take the top card of your deck and put it into your discard pile. This succeeds if the value of that card, plus your dude's huckster skill, is equal to or greater than the spell's difficulty. Gadgets are very similar. The main difference is that you only need to make a skill pull when you invent a gadget as a shop and play. After you pay the cost for the gadget, make a skill pull and see if it succeeds. If it does, you get to keep the gadget in around and use it as you see fit. You can even trade the gadget to another player. Any goods card can be traded as a noon action to another dude you control if you're at home or a deed you control. Jobs are a unique type of action found on dudes, spells, and action cards. These cards will always allow a great game effect, be it extra ghost rock, new dudes coming to town, or even discarding an opposing dude. That is, of course, unless your opponent tries to stop you. To run a job, select one of your unbooted dudes to lead the job. The job will tell you what the mark is. On the card Ambush, we're going to select any dude in play. Once we have a leader and a mark, we form posses like in a shootout. The mark's controller decides if they want to oppose the job and form a posse of their own. If they choose to not form a posse, the job is automatically successful. If they do form a posse, all dudes move to the mark's location unbooted and start a shootout. If the leader's posse wins the shootout, the job succeeds. Otherwise, the job fails and the game moves on. Regardless, survivors and the leader's posse move home booted. The last thing we'd like to share with you are some advanced topics to help you greenhorns make a name for yourselves. Starting posses are very important and set you up for the rest of the game. Ensure you start with enough influence on the board to survive an early landslide of deeds from your opponent. Make sure you have plenty of production in the early game. Don't pick dudes with too large of an upkeep, otherwise you won't be able to hire more dudes or build more deeds. You don't have to defend every fight. Your opponent may try to take your early deeds, but it's not worth losing the game over. Always remember how much control you need to win. You may be able to trick an opponent into booting his dudes, and then you could sneak around the town without having to win a fight. And that's it! I hope you've enjoyed your first day in Doomtown. 
Stick around for a while and you can see just what kind of craziness we can get into. Thanks for listening.